She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate everybody welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another coffee and crime time and today for a change we have some good news lucy letby is officially the uk's most prolific child serial killer and she's been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole which is the most severe punishment under british law and it puts her in the company of other monsters like herself such as rose west and Myra Hindley. And obviously I say it's good news, not because Lucy Letby is the most prolific child killer in the history of the UK, but because she has that title, which she has uh, very much earned and very much deserves. So today we're going to go over everything new and sort of wrap Lucy Letby up because she's finally going to face justice for the horrible things that she's done, although she did find a way to disrespect the parents of her victims one last time before the doors of her prison cell closed behind her for good. And we're going to get into all of that. But first, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. We already know that Surfshark VPN can provide you a lot of security and peace of mind on the internet, and we are going to talk about that. But first, did you know that you can unlock 15 of the largest Netflix country libraries using Surfshark? Do you remember when we used to be able to watch all of our favorite shows, all of the best shows on Netflix, and we didn't need to pay for 359 other streaming services to do so. So many of my favorite shows left Netflix for other services like Hulu, Peacock, HBO Max, but overseas, they're still available on Netflix. The Office is available on Netflix in Canada, Germany, the UK, way more too. Rick and Morty is still on Netflix in the UK, and the same with Schitt's Creek, which broke my heart when it left Netflix because it was one of my good go-to comfort shows. Like if I'm having a bad day, I'm putting on Schitt's Creek or The Vampire Diaries or Gossip Girl. Luckily, with Surfshark VPN, all you have to do is connect to a server in the country of your choice, and you can get these shows on Netflix once again, like Magic, or being the sole owner of a time machine that only you know about, and also everyone who uses Surfshark VPN also knows about. So you're a part of a time-traveling community. But aside from the entertainment value of Surfshark VPN, which is extensive, we can admit, they're also going to work behind the scenes to protect you in that dark and scary place we call the internet. Surfshark VPN secures your data with industry-leading encryption in the most secure VPN protocols, and Surfshark also provides IP and DNS leak protection so nobody can figure out where you're connecting from. I also love that unlike your internet service provider, Surfshark VPN has a strict no-logs policy. They aren't watching and recording what you're doing on the internet because you're a grown-up. It's none of their business. So what can you do better on the internet with Surfshark VPN? Pretty much everything. You can overcome location price-based discrimination on travel expenses like plane tickets and rental cars. If you're traveling internationally, you can log into a server in your home country so your bank account doesn't flag you and lock you out or freeze your account for security purposes. You can also feel safe on public Wi-Fi, which is not something people can usually say because Surfshark encrypts your data and makes it impossible to steal. And you can easily and quickly get around censorship and geo-blocking so that all the information you want is available at your fingertips and 
and not just what they want you to see. Now, at this time, Surfshark has reached the coverage of 100 countries. They are the only VPN to do so at this point, which is pretty great. And Surfshark has an app for every platform, PC, Mac, Linux, Android, iOS, Smart TVs, Amazon Fire Stick, uh, Apple TV, Chrome, Firefox, Xbox, and PlayStation. One subscription allows you to install and run Surfshark on an unlimited number of devices at once. There's so much value in Surfshark VPN, and they think you'll agree as well, which is why they're giving you a 30-day money-back guarantee, and that gives you plenty of time to try it out risk-free. Now, all you have to do to take advantage of Surfshark VPN is go to surfshark.deal slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.00 and 21 cents a month. It's very, very affordable, and the value is far more than you're going to pay. Once again, go to surfshark.deal slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off a two-year subscription plus three extra months for free. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video, and let's dive in. So I'm going to do like a quick recap, and then I'm going to just segue into information we haven't talked about before, and it's going to be a seamless transition, I have to tell you. It's going to be a seamless transition, and I'm not going to say when I'm moving from the recap into what we haven't discussed before, because you guys don't need me to do that. You're smart. So Lucy Letby was charged with the murder of seven newborns who were patients at the Countess of Chester Hospital, where she worked as a nurse in the neonatal unit. She also attempted to take the lives of six more babies before she was finally stopped. Actually, in my opinion, she tried to take the lives of many more babies, but she was only charged with uh, six attempted murders. And all of this happened between 2015 and 2016. Now, keep that in mind, because I think it was easy to forget, especially over the last videos we did about Lucy, when we talked about each patient that she attacked how short of a time period she operated within, how mentally damaged and deranged you have to be to do all of this, but not only that, to do all of it, but to do all of it in such a short time. It was almost like a compulsion for her. So it kind of all started on June 22nd, 2015, when a baby girl died 36 hours after her birth. And this was the third infant death to occur at the Countess of Chester Hospital in a fortnight. And that would be equal to the total number of deaths on the neonatal unit for the entire year of 2014. So obviously it was significant. And some employees at the hospital began to take notice and they asked themselves, why is this happening? What's the common factor in these deaths? And it wasn't just deaths either, right? Uh, A lot of babies were also collapsing. They would be perfectly fine or, you know, maybe they were a little sick because they're premature and they have low birth rate and they need a little extra TLC, but they were stable and they were doing fine. And then all of a sudden they crashed out of nowhere and no one could figure out why. One of the people who took notice was a pediatric consultant, a doctor at the hospital, Dr. Stephen Breary, and he raised concerns in July of 2015 during a meeting with the director of nursing, Allison Kelly. We're going to talk about Allison, too, at the end of the video. He also raised his concerns with other senior officials at the hospital, all of which should lose their jobs and not be able to get a job in healthcare ever again. That's just my opinion. (laughs) Don't come for me, but you should share it. Dr. Breary wanted an internal review conducted into the death of this baby girl who had died on June 22nd, and a staffing analysis was done, which revealed that Lucy Letby had been on duty for all three of these infant deaths. At that point, the three deaths seemed to have nothing in common, and no foul play was immediately suspected. And even Dr. Breary remembers saying during that meeting, when they found out that Lucy was the common denominator, he said, quote, oh no, it can't be Lucy, not nice Lucy, end quote. (laughs) Nice Lucy, my ass. On August 5th, the blood sugar levels of a premature baby boy on the unit fell dangerously low. The day after his twin brother had died following an unexpected and unexplained collapse. So that's two babies, 
twins. One dies. The next day, his twin brother collapses. So a blood sample from the living twin was sent to Royal Liverpool Hospital for tests. And on August 13th, the test results came back showing an abnormally high level of insulin in the baby's blood, which indicated it was not naturally produced, right? The, your body wouldn't produce insulin in this way. So the insulin had to have been given to the baby um, by a person. It was synthetic insulin. And that was not part of this baby's treatment. On October 23rd, another premature baby girl died on the unit, and once again, the death of the baby boy in August and the death of the baby girl in October had something in common. Lucy Letby had been on shift at the time of both, and she was always sort of like either the nurse of these patients or in the periphery. Um, she would be helping out with these babies. She would be stepping in. She'd be assigned to another nursery, and they'd find her in the nursery of the baby that crashed. And this is where Dr. Dr. Stephen Breary began to seriously wonder if it could be true that nice Lucy might be harming these babies. And so he brought his concerns to Arian Powell, the unit manager. But Powell didn't seem convinced, writing Breary an email calling the association that he'd made between Lucy and the unexpected deaths as unfortunate, insisting that each cause of death had been different and that Lucy's connection to them was just a coincidence. So she's not saying that it's unfortunate that these things are happening. She's saying that Dr. Breary, seeing, you know, the pattern and speaking it out loud, speaking the truth out loud, not being afraid to offend anybody, that was unfortunate. So Dr. Brary tried to explain it wasn't just babies who were dying. It was also babies who were having sudden collapses, needing to be resuscitated. Lucy also seemed to be around for those as well. But his questions, his suspicions, his logical evaluation of the situation, it fell on deaf ears. That same month, Dr. Brary's concerns were passed on to Allison Kelly again. She was the director of nursing at the hospital at this time. But he never heard anything from her about it. In February of 2016, another consultant, Dr. Ravi Jararam, claims to have seen Lucy standing over a baby whose breathing tube had been dislodged. And despite, you know, the machines going off saying that this, this baby's vital signs were not stable, despite the baby's oxygen levels dropping, Lucy just stood there and looked at this baby, making no move to fix the breathing tube or to do anything at all. And when he heard about this, Dr. Stephen Breary once again reached out to Allison Kelly as well as the medical director, Ian Harvey, and he requested an urgent meeting. He also requested a thematic review from an independent neonatologist based at Liverpool Women's Hospital. This review took place on February 8, 2016, but it did not find a reason for the increased number of infant deaths and collapses on the unit. This did not satisfy Dr. Breary, who wrote an email to Arian Powell on March 2nd saying, quote, I think we still need to talk about Lucy. Maybe when you are back and free, the three of us can meet to talk about it, end quote. Powell would clearly not share Breary's sense of urgency, and over the next three months, another two babies died, one on April 9th after suffering a hypoglycemic episode at around the same time as his twin brother collapsed and had to be resuscitated. Blood samples were once again sent out, this time from the twin who died, and once again they came back showing very high levels of synthetic insulin, which meant the insulin had been administered to this child in levels that were far too high for his little body and for the fact that he didn't need insulin. His body was producing the normal amount of insulin that was not a problem for him. In May, Dr. Breary was finally able to get a meeting with Ellison Kelly and other senior hospital managers, and during this meeting, he claimed he really was sure now. He had no doubts about his suspicions. And he's saying this as a professional, as a medical professional, and as someone who's kind of observing from an unbiased outside perspective, but still nothing came from it. And Lucy was allowed to continue working closely with the hospital's most vulnerable patients, newborn babies who needed extra help, babies who were born premature, babies who were sometimes born with health issues. She was still allowed to work with them on a regular basis. They couldn't just be like, oh, you know, let's pull her off for a couple weeks. Just see what's going on, see if these things stop. No, no, they did nothing. 
And as happy as I am that Lucy's finally going to, you know, (laughs) face the music for what she's done, all of these hospital officials who allowed this to continue, as I said, need to lose their jobs. They need to be blackballed in the medical industry. They need to only have their applications for work taken seriously at places like McDonald's. Well, actually, I don't even know if they should work there. They shouldn't work with people's food. What can they do? What can people who care nothing about vulnerable babies do for for work what can they do but besides you know them not being able to work anywhere in the UK or America please ever again they should be thrown behind bars they should be joining Lucy in prison maybe not forever but for long enough so that they learn their lesson in June triplet boys were born seven weeks premature but luckily at birth even though they were seven weeks premature they were strong they were healthy they were doing well so Lucy had actually been on vacation with her friends in Ibiza I'm not gonna say Ibiza I know people do that okay I know people pretentious people do that but it just it feels weird to me um it feels weird to be Ibiza no I'm gonna say Ibiza so she's on vacation with her friends in Ibiza when these three triplet boys were born but on June 21st, she was back and she texted a friend saying, quote, probably be back with a bang, end quote. Oh, I hate her. And during her first shift back at the hospital, what happened? Well, two of the three triplets were dead. On June 24th, Dr. Breary called Karen Reese, a senior nurse who was on call that day. And he told her, listen, uh, Lucy came back from vacation and a baby died and and then another baby collapsed and is on like the verge of death and me and some of the other doctors we really think that maybe lucy shouldn't work her next scheduled shift on june 25th because no one's safe but of course karen didn't freaking listen and honestly this is just like conjecture and speculation but i guarantee you karen's over here with like lucy like whispering like oh my god these doctors think they know everything like who are these men to come in and tell us like we're the ones that do all the work you know like they can just go somewhere with that like so i guarantee you that's what's happening because it was i think around this time that lucy started to become aware she was under suspicion which you'd think a normal person would be like hey let me slow my roll let me like wait till the heat's off Not Lucy, though. Not Lucy, because on June 25th, after being on shift for just 90 minutes, another premature baby boy needed medical attention, emergency medical attention, after his blood oxygen levels and heart rate dramatically dropped. He was transferred to another hospital, and luckily he recovered. Dr. Breary recalled that there'd been a meeting that was sort of put together at this point after the death of the second triplet. And this meeting was for staff who were having a hard time coping emotionally with these tragic events because I imagine it is incredibly difficult, right? If you're a nurse, if you're working with these small, little, vulnerable babies and they just keep, you know, passing away unexpectedly, it would be very traumatic for like a normal person with a heart and a soul and a conscience and uh, who, who doesn't come from the depths of hell. Now, Lucy was present during during this meeting, of course, because she's got FOMO like no one we know. And Breary said that while a lot of the employees appeared to be struggling, and in fact, he said, crumbling before his eyes, Lucy, she was fine. She was fine. She was cheerful. She wasn't upset at all. And Dr. Breary, he was like, hey, you know, maybe you're tired. Maybe you're upset. Maybe you should take a break. And she's like, nah, I'm good, dude. I'm good. In fact, I'm going to be back on shift tomorrow. Okay, and that is the shift that uh, Dr. Brewery had asked Karen Reese to take her off and he was ignored and then another baby crashed on that shift. So once again, a normal person would be upset and even a slightly smart criminal who was getting away with these horrendous crimes would be like, hey, people are watching me. People are suspecting me. Maybe I should just chill for a couple of days. But not Lucy, because she really, I think at that point, had... um, completely lost the plot like and and the prosecutor will say something like this during the trial like after she came back from Ibiza she was completely out of control she was on a rampage at that point she had gotten away with so much for so long she thought she was untouchable 
So Dr. Beery says that he challenged Karen Reese, uh, the nurse, the senior nurse on duty. And he was like, why? Why would you make this decision to keep Lucy on her shift when all of this is happening, when she's the common denominator and against the wishes of seven consulting doctors who are really concerned about this? And he asked her, you know, well, will you take responsibility for anything that might happen to any babies the following day on Lucy's shift, which would be June 25th? And to which Karen replied she would. Yes, she would take responsibility. So how's that going, Karen? How's that responsibility feel? How? How does it feel? How do you feel? After the collapse of another baby the following day, Lucy was still allowed to work three shifts before she was moved from the neonatal unit and placed in an administrative role in the hospital's risk and patient safety office, which um, we also heard during the trial that in this office, she had access not only to confidential patient information, confidential employee information, but also she had access to many of the senior management officials at the hospital who had just done the most up until then to protect her and who were supposed to be evaluating her to see if she was a risk to her patients. And the funny thing was, when Lucy was moved to a different place and taken off the neonatal units, the unexplained deaths and collapses suddenly ceased altogether. (laughs) Imagine that. And listen, you may be hoping that I'm going to go into Lucy's side of things, that I'm going to tell you about the defense, the defense that her attorney put up for her, which was basically saying, like, oh, she had nothing to do with this. Um, All of these babies' deaths were due to inadequacies in the hospital, um, shortcomings at the hospital, negligence on the hospital's part. And, like, no doubt, I think we've already, you know, talked about enough to completely agree that the hospital was insanely negligent in in these cases. However, that doesn't mean that Lucy didn't do what she did, right? She was allowed to get away with it by the hospital, so they are also at fault. But it doesn't mean that she didn't do what she did. And clearly, he didn't put up an iota of evidence during the trial to prove that anyone was responsible for these babies' deaths besides Lucy Letby because, I mean, she's going away for life. Can I get a round of applause for that? Every time I say it, it makes me feel good. So on June 29th, 2016, one of the senior doctors wrote an email to hospital managers saying, quote, I believe we need help from outside agencies who can deal with suspicion. At the moment, we are all under suspicion, and the only agency who can investigate all of us, I believe, is the police, end quote. Now, medical director Ian Harvey responded curtly, in my opinion, to this suggestion, writing, quote, It has already been discussed and action is being taken. All emails cease forthwith, end quote, which is basically like we pulled her off. Babies aren't dying anymore. What do you want us to do about it? Let's stop talking about this. We don't need to talk about this anymore. We're leaving a paper trail. On July 1st, some of the doctors who were in favor of bringing in the police attended a meeting with hospital senior management, during which they were told by the head of corporate affairs and legal services for the hospital, Stephen Cross, that calling the police would be catastrophic for the hospital. It would make them all look bad. (laughs) Ian Harvey, he did bring in the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health to review the neonatal unit. I think it was performative. If you want to know how I feel, I think it was just like, oh, to show he was doing something. But they didn't arrive to the hospital to do this until September of 2016. So we're going on years now, years where Lucy's just walking around free, acting like an idiot. So the RCPCH concluded that a thorough and external independent review of each unexpected neonatal death was recommended. (laughs) So he brought them in and he's like, do a review, okay? I'm like do a review so we don't have to bring in somebody like independent or like the police and they came back and they were like we think you should get an external independent review done so from july to september the neonatal services at the countess of chester hospital were reduced by cutting cot space and increasing the gestational age limit for admission from a minimum of 27 weeks to 32 weeks basically this is damage control at this point um they're like okay we don't want our nurses to be overwhelmed and we also at this moment don't want to be caring for these especially vulnerable babies who are born super premature at like 27 weeks. So we'll just take them in at 32 weeks when their conditions will be far easier to manage. 
An email was also sent out to all the nurses on July 15th, letting them know that they would each be undergoing a period of clinical supervision. And the email said that Lucy Letby had agreed to undergo this supervision first on July 18th. So on September 7th, Lucy Letby, in all the glorious audacity that a zero level of self-awareness will give you, She filed a formal grievance against her employer after the Royal College of Nursing Union informed her by letting her know that there were allegations of her involvement in the deaths of the babies. And like I said, there had already been rumors, there had already been gossip. She already knew that she was sort of like under the microscope. On October 16th, Dr. Stephen Breary contacted a woman named Dr. Jane Hodden. She's a premature baby specialist in London, and he asked her to review the case notes of the babies who had died on the neonatal unit. Hodden recommended that four of these deaths be forensically investigated, but guess what? They never were. In early January 2017... Ian Harvey, the hospital's director, he presented the findings of all of these reviews to the hospital board. Now, we know that both reviews had recommended further investigation, an external review of at least some of the deaths. But that is allegedly not what Ian Harvey told the board. Okay, so according to the BBC.com, quote, records of the meeting show Mr. Harvey saying the reviews concluded the problems with the neonatal unit were down to leadership and timely intervention, end quote. So instead of telling the board, which I get it, like I don't get it, but I understand why he wouldn't be like super upfront with the board because the board makes all the decisions for the hospital, especially when it comes to like funding. So he wouldn't want to be completely transparent because he wouldn't want them to know how terrible the situation actually was, how dire it was, how he and others had been negligent in allowing Lucy to operate for as long as she did. And then in late January of 2017, the seven doctors who'd been making a lot of noise about Lucy Latby and her possible connection to the untimely deaths, they were called into a meeting with senior managers, including Ian Harvey and also Tony Chambers, who is the CEO of the hospital. Okay, the CEO of the hospital and the hospital director called these seven doctors into this meeting. And during this meeting, these seven professional doctors who were good hearted, who were trying to do the right thing, who had been trying to do the right thing for, you know, uh, over a year at this point, they were basically treated like naughty children. Chambers, the CEO, he told them that he'd spent a lot of time with Lucy Letby and her parents and he'd apologized to them because Lucy had done nothing wrong. Tony Chambers, what a dick. Now, Tony Chambers has come out and he's claimed he never said that Lucy did nothing wrong. He said he was paraphrasing her father. Why would, why would you do that? Like, come on, man. Come on. I don't believe you. However, Dr. Stephen Breary also claims that Chambers told him and the other doctors, get this, to apologize to Lucy, to apologize to Lucy, and that there was going to be consequences if they crossed the line again. These doctors were forced to send Lucy emails telling her they were very sorry for the stress and upset that she had experienced the last year. Can you imagine? Can you literally imagine, like, this can't be real? This cannot be real. Because by this point, these people, these hospital um, officials, these upper-level management of this hospital, they're smart, right? They have to be. They have to be college-educated. They they found these positions or they found themselves in these positions somehow. They have to be qualified in some way, right? They have to have at least two brain cells to rub together to make a spark. And there's no way you could look at the data, look at what those independent reviews said, look at Lucy and and not at least think there was some possibility she could be responsible. So to make these doctors who had been doing their jobs and hadn't been killing babies apologize to this murderer, this psychopath, is it's just bananas to me. It's bananas. It's like beyond anything that I can comprehend. My brain keeps seizing and trying to like ingest itself every time I think about it. But it gets worse. Two of the doctors were ordered to attend mediation sessions with Lucy in March. Uh, One of them, 
did this. The other, who was Dr. Stephen Breary, flat out refused. And good for you, Dr. Stephen Breary. Good for you standing on your morals, standing on your conviction. We need more people like that who aren't just going to be bullied and shamed into being quiet about problems that need to be talked out loud about. Breary has since claimed that he felt the hospital managers were trying to engineer some sort of narrative that would allow them to not have to go to the police. And he said, quote, if you want to call that a cover-up, then it's a cover-up, end quote. I personally do want to call it a cover-up. I think it absolutely was a cover-up. That's just my opinion, of course. Allegedly, don't come for me. But yeah, I do want to call it a cover-up. I I don't know what else you would call it. Negligence, ignorance, laziness, a cover-up. I don't know. Luckily, Stephen Breary and the others, they did not back down. After they typed out their forced little emails, they didn't shut up. They didn't smile and look pretty to keep little nice Lucy from being hurt and upset and offended. They kept pushing. And by April, the police had been informed of what was going on at Countess of Chester Hospital. Now, when police sat down with Dr. Breary and Dr. Jeram, they were told that the deaths and the collapses had stopped once Lucy was removed from the neonatal unit. And at that point, Operation Hummingbird was launched. Detectives went through hundreds of hours of shift timetables, finding that only one person had been on shift at the time of each tragedy. And that was Lucy Letby. Detective Superintendent Paul Hughes said, quote, she was the thread running through them all, end quote. And Detective Hughes also said, like, listen, I talked to the parents of these children and I told them I was going to get to the bottom of it. I was going to find out who had hurt their children. And for Hughes, it wasn't a matter of trying to save face for a hospital that he was employed by. It wasn't a matter of, you know, being threatened or bullied to fall in line. This is his job. He made a promise to these parents and he did not care where the evidence led him. On May 18th, 2017, the Cheshire Police announced that they were launching an investigation into the deaths and collapses at the hospital, and they would be focusing specifically on eight deaths with a review of seven other deaths and six non-fatal collapses. On July 3rd, 2018, Lucy Letby was arrested for the first time at her home on Westbourne Road in Chester. She would be arrested an additional two more times. And not only did the police search Lucy's house, but they also searched the home of her parents in Hereford and her new office at the hospital. And at that time, the police also announced that the investigation had broadened to 17 deaths and 15 non-fatal collapses. During their searches, law enforcement uncovered many incriminating pieces of evidence, including a green post-it note inside a 2016 diary. And on the post-it note, Lucy had scribbled the words, I am evil. I did this. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. End quote. Another post-it note, this one yellow, had words scribbled over every available inch, almost as if somebody who was in a manic and psychotic state had scratched them into the post-it note. And this post-it note included the words, I'm sorry that you couldn't have a chance at life, and also the word HELP written in all capital letters. Is that what you imagined your patients who were newborn babies and couldn't speak or ask for help were screaming in their heads as you tortured them? Lucy? Detectives also found 257 confidential medical documents in Lucy's possession, including handover and resuscitation sheets, as well as blood gas readings. And most of these were all hidden away in plastic bags. And then I remember something Lucy said during the trial. She was like, oh, I I just like to collect paper. What the fuck? What? What? That's the best you could come up with? You're this like criminal mastermind getting away with like murder after murder for, for two years? And that's the best you could come up with? Oh, she said sometimes she just forgot. You know, she put them in her pocket and she forgot. And then she said she liked to collect papers. She liked to collect papers. They also found a picture of a sympathy card that Lucy had sent the parents of one of her victims. And she wrote in the sympathy card, thinking of you today and always. Sorry, I cannot be there to say goodbye. Now, Lucy had actually taken the picture with her phone hours before the infant's funeral. And that's what she was saying. She was sorry she couldn't be there to say goodbye. She couldn't be at the funeral. Like, you think this bitch would have literally had the audacity to go to the funeral of a baby she killed? Like, what, what was she even invited? Why was she, like, sorry, I can't be there? Was she invited? Was she, were you invited? 
Mm. Additionally, Lucy's Facebook data revealed that she repeatedly looked up the parents of her victims, not just after their deaths, but on the anniversary of their deaths. And on Christmas Day, what a literal banana nut Sunday with extra nuts. This is like uh, she wanted to look at the parents on these special occasions, such as the anniversary of their baby's death, uh, Christmas, because she knew this is the times when these parents would be mourning the most, when they would be the most heartbroken, when they would be struggling with their loss in the highest of levels. And she got off on it, right? She got off on it. That's why she looked the parents up right after the deaths of these babies, because she wanted to be able to experience what they were saying and how they were feeling in like real time, when it was the most fresh, when it was the most present. That's why she would stay in the room with these parents while they mourned the deaths of their babies. She would sit there and watch like an energy vampire soaking up their grief and their pain and their hurt and their tears and the darkness that she had caused. I can't stand her. Honestly, life in prison is far more than she deserves. And like, is it wrong for me to say that I truly hope she gets the shit kicked out of her by the other inmates in prison? I really, because I mean, you're, you, she doesn't even know. She doesn't even know what is in store for her. She's a woman going to a woman's prison after murdering Baby after baby, infant after infant, newborn after newborn. And she's going to be imprisoned with a bunch of women who, A, probably have committed some violent crimes themselves because this is a high security facility, and B, probably have children of their own. And they're going to tear you apart, dude. <laughs> you're, 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 you're going to, you're. That's all I'll say. The month after Lucy's arrest, a new medical director took over for Ian Harvey. Her name was Dr. Susan Gilby, and she claims that she'd been told by Harvey that she would need to pursue action with the General Medical Council, which is a regulatory body for um, medical professionals. But she wasn't told she was going to have to pursue action against Lucy Letby. Instead, she was told she was going to have to pursue action against the seven doctors who'd made claims against Lucy, leading to her arrest in bad publicity for the hospital. He didn't say the bad publicity for the hospital thing, but, you know, I'm just letting you know because I don't need Dr. Ian Harvey suing me. But also, <laughs> that's pretty much, in my opinion, what he meant. Like, that's what he would have been mad about. Now, Ian Harvey denies ever seeing this, um, you know his word against her word. Who do I believe? Probably Dr. Gilby and not the person who tried to cover up what Lucy was doing for, you know, over a year. But Dr. Gilby believes that the lack of action and the refusal to call the police appeared to be heavily influenced by how it would look. And she said, quote, protecting their reputation was a big factor in how people responded to concerns raised, end quote. Dr. Gilby also became CEO of the hospital when Tony Chambers resigned in late 2018. Did he resign or did he run away in shame? Did he run away and try to hide from the repercussions of what he had been a part of? But anyways, he resigned in late 2018. But Gilby only held this job until 2022. And it's worth noting that she's now suing the hospital trust for unfair dismissal. So do without what you will. Lucy was questioned by police several times, and her demeanor during these interviews led Detective Paul Hughes and many other law enforcement officials to believe that she had known she was going to be arrested. He said she seemed very calm for someone being arrested for the first time, and her controlled manner during her interviews, it raised some red flags for him. Hughes said, quote, she was emotionless. She cooperated. She answered questions. It was surprising. This was someone who had never been involved with police before in her life. She's arrested for eight murders and six attempted murders and brought into custody. At no point did she appear to be struggling with anything. She was quiet. She wasn't obstructive. She dealt with everything. She was controlled. There was no banging on the table. At no point did she say, you're saying these babies have been killed? I cared for these babies. Go find the killer. It's not me. There was very much an acceptance that we were going to come knock on her door at some point, end quote. Yeah, I'm sure she kind of figured out when she was removed from the neonatal unit that they had enough to, to be able to legally do that because, you know, she was uh, so, so quick to file complaints and try to get people in trouble. So she probably knew they had enough suspicion and enough evidence to, to do that to her. And then, yeah, she probably knew that it was about 
to come, like the axe was about to fall. Police showed Lucy results of some blood tests, and these blood tests proved that two of her patients had been deliberately poisoned with insulin. And Detective Danielle Stonier said that Lucy seemed to have no understanding of what that meant, which I I don't believe she had no understanding of what it meant. She was a Band 5 nurse. She (laughs) was pretty smart. She was good at her job, right? I mean, when she was actually taking care of patients, she was known to be respectable among her colleagues, you know, for being a hard worker and doing the right thing and having a good base of knowledge. She definitely knew what that meant. She was playing dumb. Detective Stonier also noted that Lucy, quote, had the ability to mentally switch off, to disengage just to get through it, end quote. And that's dissociation. And, you know, that can be a healthy way to cope with things. Or if you do it enough, if you're doing it to avoid responsibility for the really bad things you've done, not, not, a, great, not a great thing to do. But one thing that has remained consistent through the investigation and the trial, besides Lucy's cold and emotionless demeanor, was her insistence that she had not killed any babies. Lucy told detectives that she had actually wanted to take her own life when she'd been unfairly linked to the deaths of her patients, and she said that she may have missed something or maybe not acted urgently enough when the babies needed treatment, but she had not killed anyone intentionally. When she was questioned about what she'd written on the post-it note, you know, where she wrote, I killed them on purpose, (laughs) she said, quote, I just wrote it because everything had got on top of me. It was when I'd not long found out I'd been removed from the unit, and they were telling me my practice might be wrong, that I needed to read all my competencies. My practice might not have been good enough. So I felt like people were blaming my practice, that I might have hurt them without knowing through my practice, and that made me feel guilty, and I just felt really isolated. I was blaming myself, but not because I'd done something, but because of the way people were making me feel. But like I'd only ever done my best for those babies. And then people were trying to say that my practice wasn't good, that I'd done something. I just couldn't cope, and I just didn't want to be here anymore. I just felt it was all just spiraling out of control. I just didn't know how to feel about it or what was going to happen or what to do. End quote. Ugh. Always the victim. Always the victim. It bothers me so much when people like Lucy do this because she's, I mean, successfully gotten away with, you know, playing the sympathy card, playing the victim card for so much of her life. And so it is her defense mechanism. It is the way that she knows to gaslight the shit out of people, right? It's like when you're in a relationship and you're fighting with your spouse, let's say I'm married to Lucy Letby. And I'm like, Lucy, like, it's really messed up that, you know, you did this thing to me. You really hurt me. And I I think that you should apologize and take accountability. And she's like, I can't believe that you're accusing me of this. Like, oh, my God, the fact that you would even say this about me is so devastating. Like, there's something wrong with me. I'm defective. What's wrong with me? What? Why am I not good enough for you? And all of a sudden, before you know it, you're comforting her, or I would be because she's my wife. I'm comforting her <laughs> and trying to reassure her that I don't think she's a bad person. You know, I don't think she's a villain. I don't think she's defective. I just am trying to, you know, have my feelings addressed and validated. And But but she doesn't want to hear that. So I'm, I'm comforting her. I came into the situation calmly asking Lucy, my wife, to listen to me and validate my feelings, very real feelings that that she had caused. And she, in a blink of an eye, had turned it around and made herself be the person who was victimized, who was feeling attacked. And it's it's really tragic to see because I do believe that this is something she probably used throughout her entire life and it probably worked for her. But in the trial – When you're faced with all of the evidence, it doesn't work for her. It didn't work for her. Now, Lucy Letby would be charged with seven murders and 15 attempted murders. She would be found guilty of all seven murders, but only of six attempted murders. And last week, after a Manchester Crown Court deliberated for 22 days, Lucy Letby was sentenced to life in prison. However, for someone who was trained in giving medicine, she certainly couldn't take her own. And she decided to refuse to be present in person at her sentencing hearing. She decided to take away the last chance of the parents of her victims to have some closure. She decided to not give the parents of her victims a chance to face her and let her know the chaos, the suffering, the pain, and the trauma 
that she'd brought into their lives. So here's the judge on Lucy's trial, Justice James Gross, um, reading out her sentencing and kind of just telling her what he thinks of her. Let's watch this together. I have to sentence her in her absence. I shall deliver the sentencing remarks as if she was present to hear them, and I direct that she is provided with a transcript of my remarks and copies of the victim personal statements read to the court. So Justice Gross is saying, you know, Lucy's not there, but he's going to make sure that what he's saying, as well as what the parents of the victims are saying, their victim impact statements are going to be like printed out and delivered to Lucy in her cell. Do we think that she's going to read them? No. But what she will do is maybe put them in like a plastic bag under her bed because she likes to collect paper. Let's continue. Lucy Letby, over a period of almost 13 months, between June 2015 and June 2016, when in your mid-twenties and employed as a neonatal nurse in the Countess of Chester Hospital in Chester with specialist training in intensive care, you murdered seven babies and attempted to murder six others. In the case of one of them, trying on separate occasions two weeks apart to murder her. You are now to be sentenced for your crimes. I order payment of the statutory surcharge in the appropriate amount. You acted in a way that was completely contrary to the normal human instincts of nurturing and caring for babies and in gross breach of the trust that all citizens place in those who work in the medical and caring professions. The babies you harmed were born prematurely, and some were at risk of not surviving. But in each case, you deliberately harmed them, intending to kill them. In your evidence, you said that hurting a baby is completely against everything that being a nurse is, as indeed it should be. You also claimed you never did anything that was meant to hurt a baby and only ever did your best to care for them. That was but one of the many lies you were found to have told in this case. I love it because he's not mincing words. You know, he's like, we, we saw the evidence, we heard the evidence, the jury saw and heard the evidence and they found you guilty, right? They definitely believe that you did something to hurt these children, and it kind of feels like he's saying the same. I don't think you could have sat in that courtroom and listened to the evidence and seen her texts and just seen the patterns and think there's no way that Lucy did anything, right? There's not even reasonable doubt in this case. None at all, zero, less than zero. There is no doubt that you are intelligent and outwardly were a very conscientious, hardworking, knowledgeable, confident, and professional nurse, which enabled you repeatedly to harm babies on the unit without arousing suspicion for some time. You prided yourself in your competence. Your fellow neonatal nurses spoke very highly of you, and several of them became your close friends. Having started as a Band 5 nurse at the Countess of Chester in 2012, you became a mentor to student nurses and in the spring of 2015 gained the qualification that enabled you to care for the sickest babies on the, units, on the unit or those requiring the most intensive care. You relished being in the intensive care nursery. Your messages to colleagues revealed an interest in babies that were on or were coming to the unit who had uncommon medical conditions. The methods you employed to carry out your murderous intent were only revealed by the later detailed investigation into the events of and surrounding the collapses and deaths of the babies, which commenced in 2018. There was premeditation, calculation, and cunning in your actions. 
you specifically targeted twins and latterly triplets. Some babies were healthy. Others had medical issues of which you were aware. The great majority of your victims suffered acute pain as a result of what you did to them. They all fought for survival. Some, sadly, struggled in vain and died. You used a number of different ways to try to kill them, thereby misleading clinicians into believing the collapses had or might have had a natural cause or a consequence of a developing medical condition. You took opportunities to harm babies when staff were in breaks or away from babies. On some occasions, you falsified records to indicate there were signs of a deterioration before a collapse occurred. You knew that the last thing anyone working in the unit would or did think was that someone caring for the babies was deliberately harming them. As the number of unexpected and unexplained collapses and deaths escalated, senior doctors started to think the unthinkable and consider the possibility that someone was, in fact, deliberately harming the babies, and you were identified as the common factor. You had a detached enthusiasm for the resuscitations and what followed. You endeavoured to impress colleagues and clinicians and sought reassurance from them as to your competence and skills and would message others to the effect that no one was at fault. Yeah, so that's something else that she did quite a bit, right? Like as these babies were falling sick, as they were crashing, as they were passing away, she would constantly message her colleagues and almost like try to relive what happened and like go over, like take a postmortem of the whole case and the whole situation. She'd be like, oh my God, this is so sad. Like I did everything that I could. Sometimes even your best isn't enough. And then they would comfort her, right? Because she's just nice little sensitive Lucy. She's just this, you know, Florence Nightingale figure who's pouring her heart and her soul into her patient's and losing them has to be so hard for her. So they have to comfort her. They have to reassure her. You're great, Lucy. You're the best nurse I've ever known. This isn't your fault at all. It's sick. It's sick what she did. Like, I mean, obviously what she did, the, the main bulk of what she did is sick. But all these little, like, side quests were also sick, right? The sending freaking cards to the parents, uh, bathing the babies and like talking to the parents after the baby died, texting her co-workers about it, like her, so sick, sick. On occasions, you cruelly and callously made inappropriate remarks to some of the grieving parents at the time of or in the immediate aftermath of a death. When the homes of both you and your parents were searched, confidential documents relating to babies, including handover and resuscitation sheets and notes and blood gas readings were found. And there were entries in a diary recording relevant events. Handover sheets relating to all but the first four of the babies had been taken from the unit and kept by you. I am satisfied you started to keep these documents after those initial offences in June 2015 as morbid records of the dreadful events surrounding the collapses of your victims and what you had done to them. You had a fascination with the babies and their families, which extended to making repeated searches on Facebook for their parents, sometimes immediately following the events and on occasions much later. A piece of paper with dense writing on both sides, setting out your thoughts and feelings, was found in the first search of your home in 2018. Amongst the phrases you wrote were, the world is better off without me, and I am evil, I did this. The impact of your crimes has been immense, as disclosed by the deeply moving personal statements that have been read to the court this morning. 
the lives of newborn or relatively newborn babies were ended almost as soon as they began, and lifelong harm has been caused, all in horrific circumstances. Loving parents have been robbed of their cherished children, and others have to live with the physical and mental consequences of your actions. Siblings have been deprived of brothers and sisters. You have caused deep psychological trauma, brought enduring grief and feelings of guilt, caused strains in relationships and disruption to the lives of all the families of all your victims. It is no part of my function to reach conclusions as to the underlying reason or reasons for your actions. Nor could I, for they are, they are known only to you. I must pass appropriate sentences according to law. Over a period of just under 13 months, you killed seven fragile babies and attempted to kill six others. Some of your victims were only a day or a few days old. All were extremely vulnerable. They were in a hospital where others were striving to provide them with dedicated medical and nursing care. By their nature and number, such murders and attempted murders by a neonatal nurse entrusted to care for them are offences of very exceptional seriousness. The damaging impact of your actions on others working at that hospital, including those who numbered you as a friend, betraying their trust and creating upset and suspicion, as well as eroding confidence in clinicians and nurses generally, aggravates their seriousness. This was a cruel, calculated, and cynical campaign of child murder involving the smallest and most vulnerable of children, knowing that your actions were causing significant physical suffering and would cause untold mental suffering. You created situations so that collapses or causes of collapses would not be obvious or associated with you. You removed and retained confidential records of events relating to your crimes and checked up on bereaved parents. There was a deep malevolence bordering on sadism in your actions. During the course of this trial, you have coldly denied any responsibility for your wrongdoing and sought to attribute some fault to others. You have no remorse there are no mitigating factors. In their tiffness and just punishment, according to law, requires a whole life order. Lucy Letby, on each of the seven offences of murder and the seven offences of attempted murder, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. Because the seriousness of your offences is exceptionally high, I direct that the early release provisions do not apply. The order of the court, therefore, is a whole life order on each and every offence, and you will spend the rest of your life in prison. So yeah, getting a life sentence like this without the possibility of parole is pretty rare um, in the UK. They, it is the strictest sentence because they don't have the death sentence. So I think like I said, exactly what she deserved. It's more than she deserved. Okay. She, she does deserve to um, be on death row, if you ask me. But even though Lucy was not there to hear them, the parents of her victims who'd been in the courtroom every day throughout this entire ordeal, they stood and they gave their impact statements. One mother said, quote, I don't think we'll ever get over the fact that our daughter was tortured until she had no fight left in her and everything she went through over her short life was deliberately done by someone who was supposed to protect her and help her come home where she belonged, end quote. Another parent said, quote, the anger and the hatred I have towards her will never go away. It has destroyed me as a man and as a father, end quote. The father of a set of twins murdered by Lucy said, quote, there is no sentence that will ever compare to the excruciating agony that we have suffered as a consequence of your actions. 
at least now, there's no debate that in your own words, you killed them on purpose. You are evil. You did this, end quote. And another mother said, quote, you thought it was your right to play God with our children's lives. You thought you could enter our lives and turn them upside down, but you will never win. We hope you live a very long life and spend every day suffering for what you've done, end quote. The mother of baby E told the court that she still felt anger when she thought of the fact that she had to grieve the loss of her child in front of Lucy Letby and other members of the neonatal unit. She was given no privacy to do this. And then her child was buried in a gown that had been a gift to her from the unit. And the gown was hand chosen by Lucy. She said, quote, we were robbed of our precious time with our baby after they died. We were denied the opportunity to spend private moments with our child, having to grieve openly in the presence of Lucy and the neonatal unit staff at Nursery One. Lucy bathed the child, an action I deeply regret, and dressed the child in a woolen gown. The child was buried in that gown, a gift from the unit chosen by Lucy. I felt sickened by the choice we made. Not a single day passes without distress over this decision, end quote. Can you imagine you find out the person who killed your baby is also the one who bathed them, dressed them for their burial, like in in the whole time reliving the the thrill that they got from taking your child's life? I can't even. I can't. I cannot. This mother also said that at first Lucy presented as kind and soft-spoken, but now she realizes it was all an act, saying, quote, The lies that she has told filled me with anger. The trial felt like a platform for Lucy to relive her crimes. She's repeatedly disrespected my child's memory, end quote. And I do think in a way the trial was a little enjoyable for Lucy in, in some ways, um, that she probably enjoyed having her, her actions, her trophies broadcast for so many people and then she could hear them again because she didn't show any emotion. She didn't cry when the prosecution talked about what she'd done to these babies. Another parent stated angrily, quote, Lucy Letby, to think that you could get any kind of gratification from inflicting pain on my child and from watching our suffering in the aftermath goes against everything that I believe to be human. I'm so horrified that someone so evil exists. To you, our child's life was just collateral damage, end quote. And the parents of baby O and P, both killed by Lucy, revealed how traumatized they were that the murderous nurse had been the last person to hold one of their children. The father said, quote, I now hate that Lucy Letby was the last person to hold my child. As time went on, around a year after the children's first anniversary, I was still struggling to come to terms with their deaths, and so I turned to alcohol. I had not really drunk excessively before. I could see how much this was all hurting my wife. I hid how much alcohol I was consuming. I was low and disgusted with myself. One day, I took the car keys and had thoughts of ending my life, end quote. And this is illustrative of the ripple effect that, that crime has on people. It's not just the victim who is victimized. It is everyone who loved that person, everyone around that person, family, friends, community. The mother of Baby M said that during the trial, she was feeling very uneasy because Lucy kept looking at her to the point where she had to move her seat to get out of Lucy's eye line. So even after all of it, after what she's done to her, to her child, Lucy has the audacity to continue basically like torturing these people and letting them know. I'm here. Your child's not, but I'm here. I'm looking at you. And honestly, I don't know how these parents were able to say her name because if it was me, that bitch would have been the only thing that would have been able to come out of my mouth during these victim impact statements. I wouldn't have been able to stand the feel and the sound of her name in my mouth. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who called the crimes of Lucy Letby shocking and harrowing, promised he would bring legislation forward which would require convicts to attend their sentencings. The UK government is now looking to change the law to compel criminals to front court during sentencing, forcing them to listen to impact statements from victims and their families. I think it's cowardly that people who commit such horrendous crimes uh, do not face their victims. Lucy Letby may never know the pain she inflicted, but her victims' families will never forget. And police are now in the process of probing the cases of 4,000 babies at Liverpool Women's Hospital, where Lucy worked before Countess of Chester, to see if she had more victims than we are even aware of. So I wanted to talk about some of the officials at Countess of Chester Hospital who, in my opinion, in the opinion of many others, allowed these travesties to happen because they couldn't do what it took to step in in time. They were so afraid 
of hurting Lucy's feelings or offending her. Um, I guess that they instead wanted to brush everything under the rug and just wait and see what happened. And I literally think somebody said that in one of these emails, like, let's just wait and see. And I guess there'd been like a ton of like anti-bullying training and stuff happening at the hospital. So some people think that it might have been as a result of that. Like everybody is so afraid of just, you know, telling it like it is of being honest because everyone's so easily offended and everyone's so overly sensitive nowadays. And they would rather just keep the peace and have things like between staff run smoothly rather than actually stand up and say like, no, this isn't right. This doesn't make sense. It's clear what's happening here. Let's stop it. Okay, so let's start with Tony Chambers. Tony Chambers was the CEO of the Countess of Chester NHS Foundation at the time of Letby's killing spree. He has said he was first told of serious concerns about the nurse in late June 2016 after she murdered her final two victims, two triplet boys, within 24 hours of each. Chambers said he took prompt action upon learning of these concerns, moving Letby off the neonatal unit, even though he was told at the time that she was an enthusiastic, capable, and committed nurse. In January 2017, he decided that Letby should be allowed to return to the neonatal unit based on two external reviews that executives felt exonerated her of any wrongdoing. However, these reviews were not set up to investigate whether Letby had harmed the babies and both concluded that several unexplained deaths required further forensic investigation. Despite this, he ordered the senior doctors to apologize to her for raising concerns that she was harming babies in her care. Five months later, in April of 2017, Chambers contacted the Cheshire police to ask that they investigate the unexplained deaths. This came days after senior doctors had outlined their concerns to a detective in the force, and he had urged them to formally report the matter to the police. So understand what this means. Tony Chambers did not call the police. The doctors by themselves went to a police officer, a member of law enforcement, and was like, this is what's going on. And that member of law enforcement was like stunned and said this needs to be reported to the police immediately. And by that point, Tony Chambers would have no other choice than to call the police. Otherwise, it really would have looked like a cover up. Really. And they probably would have come in and investigated on their own anyways. Chambers resigned from his 160,000 pound a year role in September 2018, three months after Letby was arrested, saying the past months had been particularly challenging. Really for you? You think they were challenging for you? <laughs> what about those babies and their parents? How challenging do you think those past months and years were for them? And he said it was the right time for the hospital to focus on its future and for me to explore new opportunities in the next stage of my career, which should be behind bars. The next stage of your career should be behind bars. He went on to work for several other NHS trusts as interim chief executive after leaving the Countess of Chester Hospital. More recently, he was interim chief executive at the Queen Victoria Hospital in West Sussex until June 2nd, 2023. Now, Ian Harvey, he was the medical director and deputy chief executive at the Countess of Chester Hospital. He reportedly became aware of the rising death rate on the neonatal unit in November of 2015, by which time Letby had murdered five babies and tried to kill three others. He was alerted to the fact that Letby was on duty for each of these suspicious incidents in early February 2016 when Dr. Stephen Brewery sent him a report. The former orthopedic surgeon, who earned up to £175,000 a year as medical director, retired with a pension pot worth a reported £1.8 million in August of 2018. This was four weeks after Letby's first arrest. He moved that same month to the south of France. Now listen, she gets arrested. He retires, collects almost two million pounds, and then he's like, I'm off. I'm off to the south of France. He needs to be brought back to face to face these questions. He needs to be brought back to face what he was a part of. Addressing the board before his departure, he joked. Yes, that's right. He joked. Quote, there's no doubt this team has been tested. It's all Tony Chambers' fault. End quote. <laughs> In a statement to the Times, get this. Ian Harvey blamed the doctors for failing to spot insulin records that showed two boys had been poisoned eight months apart. He said, quote, these serious medication errors were never brought to my attention either directly or through the trust's Datix incident reporting system, end quote. It's the doctor's fault. The doctors who are begging you to look into Lucy, to look into these deaths, it's, it's their fault? Screw you, dude. He added, quote, at this time, my thoughts are with the babies whose treatment has been the focus of the trial and with their parents and relatives who have been through something unimaginable, end quote. I really doubt that any of these parents give a shit about anything you have to say, and they do not want your thoughts to be with them at 
at all. Allison Kelly. So Allison Kelly was the head of nursing during the time that Lucy Let Be went on a killing spree. She was the first executive to be told of the nurse's connection to three unexplained deaths in the space of a fortnight in June of 2016. She was alerted to Let Be's presence when these deaths occurred in a meeting, um, and that happened on July 2nd, 2015. And at that stage, she basically said that Lucy's connection, remember, was unfortunate. The fact that Stephen Breary was bringing it up was unfortunate and that it was just a coincidence. As the number of unexplained deaths and collapses increased, Kelly was asked for help by Powell, Arian Powell. On March 17, 2016, Powell's plea reportedly went unanswered. Remember that when Allison Kelly's getting emails like, you know, are we still talking about this? She just didn't respond back. And she twice had to chase for a meeting, getting one 56 days later. At the beginning of May 2016, Brewery emailed Kelly flagging Letby's presence at the deaths and asking for a meeting. Kelly's reported to have sent this email to Ian Harvey, the medical director, another idiot who doesn't know what he's doing. And she expressed concern that a senior doctor was implicating a nurse and told him that she'd seen no evidence but a wider review might be needed. So Kelly is the director of nursing at the Rashadal Care Organization within the Northern Care Alliance NHS Foundation Trust. It's one of the largest NHS trusts in the country and employs 20,000 staff. The Northern Care Alliance announced on Monday that she'd been suspended but did not comment further. And in a statement released on Friday after the verdicts, Kelly said it was impossible to imagine the heartache suffered by the families involved and her thoughts are very much with them. Once again, they don't want your thoughts to be with them. Your thoughts should have been with them when Lucy hadn't attacked their children yet. Your thoughts should have been with them when you saw what was happening, you saw the pattern, and you said, no more, not another baby. That's when your thoughts should have been with them, not now, when you literally allowed it to happen, when you were passively sitting there hoping to not offend little nice Lucy, and instead what you did was allow her to victimize baby after baby after baby. She added, quote, these are truly terrible crimes. Oh, you you admit that they're crimes now, Allison Kelly? And I'm deeply sorry that this happened to them. We owe it to the babies and their families to learn lessons. And I will fully cooperate with the independent inquiry announced. How many babies need to die before you all learned a lesson? Why did it take so many for you to learn the lesson? Why did it take so many? And Lucy being arrested and Lucy being charged with murder, found guilty of all these murders, put in prison for life and you to get suspended from your position, for you to learn a lesson. Hmm? Why? Now we have Karen Moore, and during the video I referred to her as Karen Reese. That's what she was then. She's now Karen Moore. She was the one who refused to take Lucy Letby off of her shift after the deaths of two babies within 24 hours. Moore, who now lives on a farm in Wales, said she was completely unaware of any complaints. What? about Letby before June 24th, 2016, the day Letby's final murder victim, an identical triplet, was killed. Letby had murdered his brother the previous day. Moore has said that as soon as Breary and another consultant came to her with concerns, she notified Kelly, the then director of nursing. Now get this, Stephen Breary testified at trial that when he went to Karen and asked her to remove Lucy Letby from her shift, Moore said that she was familiar with the concerns already, or he said that he approached her because she was familiar with the concerns already. So she's saying she had no idea, and he's saying no, she was aware. So Karen Moore left the trust in 2018 and now runs a holiday rental near her home in Dengbikshire, North Wales. She said she was taking legal advice about the allegations. She refused to act on warnings about Letby. You should. You should get a lawyer. Get a lawyer. Stephen Cross was the hospital's director of legal services and head of corporate affairs. He was the one who in that meeting was like, we're not going to call the police because it's going to make us all look bad, right? He has been accused by senior doctors of putting the trust reputation above patient safety. Two consultant pediatricians told The Guardian that Cross said contacting the police would be terrible for the hospital and that it would turn the neonatal unit into a crime scene. He allegedly made the remarks in July 2016 when senior doctors first suggested contacting the police. The force was not briefed until almost a year later in May of 2017. Now, The Guardian, where I'm reading this information from, they've made repeated attempts to contact Cross. A family member who answered the telephone at his home in Chester refused to comment and disconnected the call. And a relative has told other journalists that Cross has nothing to say. <sighs> nothing to say. You can run, Stephen Cross. You can run. You can run like uh, other dude did to the south of France. You can just run away from your problems, but you cannot hide forever, and you will have to answer for this. And this is the worst part. Stephen Cross, do you know what he did? Do you know what he did before he became legal counsel 
for the trust. He was a police officer. I mean, slap in the face upon slap in the face at this point. And yes, they say there's going to be an investigation into the people behind this, into what they did, into what they didn't do. But it doesn't bring those babies back. So we are left with the question of why. Why would Lucy Letby do this? Why would anyone do this? Detective Chief Inspector Paul Hughes told People Magazine that Letby's motives remain unclear. And he said, quote, Ultimately, the only person that can answer that in respect to why is Lucy Letby herself. As with any investigation, the foundations around following the evidence and not speculating on motive. So where the motive is interesting, when you can find it, it's not something we deploy a massive amount of resources into because it's more about the evidence. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever know unless she chooses to tell us. But when you listen to the evidence and actually just how delicate these babies are in the position that they're in, then you realize it doesn't take much whatsoever. And it becomes very clear that somebody with a sinister mind in that environment, I believe, can create themselves the opportunity to cause harm, end quote. However, there were some possible motives brought up during the trial. Throughout the trial and during closing statements, prosecutor Nick Johnson suggested that Lucy Letby enjoyed playing God by making babies sick and then being the one to alert her colleagues about it. Referring to the final baby she murdered, Johnson explained how she had killed baby O the day before she killed his brother, baby P, and a post-mortem revealed fresh blood in his stomach and damage to his liver, and this was blamed on an intravenous air embolism. The day after she attacked uh, baby O, she attacked baby P, and the decision was made to send this baby to a different hospital after he crashed in the morning. Now, a doctor was on the scene, a doctor who came and rushed to the baby to, you know, hopefully save him. Him, she was hopeful that once the infant was moved to a facility that had better resources to handle babies who are in more critical condition, she was hopeful that he would recover. And this doctor heard Lucy make the remark, quote, he's not leaving here alive, is he? End quote. And Lucy's ominous prediction would come true. And before the baby could get the help he desperately needed, he was dead by 4 p.m. that same day after Lucy moved his breathing tube and did a plethora of other horrendous things to him. Lucy claimed she couldn't remember having that conversation or making that remark. But Nick Johnson told the jury, quote, ladies and gentlemen, she did say it. But why did she say it? There's only one answer, because she knew the end game. She knew what was going to happen. She was controlling things. She was enjoying what was going on and happily predicting what she knew was going to happen, end quote. But there may have been another reason that Lucy would have wanted to make a baby sick that morning, because when babies crash in the neonatal unit, doctors have to respond. And that leads us to our next motive, that Lucy wanted to get the attention of a married doctor who worked in the hospital that she not only had quite a large crush on, but it appears she was also having an active relationship with him that continued even after she was removed from the neonatal unit, even after suspicions and allegations started coming out against her. Lucy and Dr. A, as he's referred to during the trial, because he doesn't have the balls to say it with his chest, he doesn't have the balls to stand in front of everybody with his face and his name and admit what he took part in, they would message each other all day long. He called her sweetie, and they exchanged heart emojis. They even met up several times outside of work for meals and dates. They traveled to London together once, and there was a second trip planned that ever happened because Lucy got arrested. Dr. A was there for Lucy when his other doctor colleagues began to suspect her of being involved with the many deaths of newborns on the unit. And when she complained to him about this unfair treatment, he texted her, quote, no more doubt. It's not you. It's the babies. This motherfucker really was blaming the babies. <sighs> Serenity now. He continues and says, you are one of the few nurses in the region and I've worked pretty much everywhere, that I would trust with my own children, end quote. I'm sure he's rethinking that statement. I'm sure his wife is rethinking um, the, the entire relationship that she had with him. Like, not only are you sleeping with this, this nurse, but now you're telling her, even after she's being accused of killing newborn babies, that you would trust your own children with her, our children? Like, I'm thinking as his wife, like, our children? What? <laughs> so... Yeah. Of course, this man did put some distance between himself and Lucy at the start of 2018 when she was being actively investigated. And this apparently caused a great deal of emotional trauma to Lucy because when Dr. A home was searched, investigators found a scribbled note to him from Lucy. And in this note, she declared her love for him, writing, quote, My best friend, love, I loved you. And I think you knew that. I trusted you with everything. I wanted you to stand by me, but you didn't. 
end quote. <laughs> so dramatic. The prosecution alleged that after Lucy got back from her Ibiza trip, she was out of control. She attacked the set of triplet boys to get Dr. A's attention and to get him on the unit because on her first day back to work, Lucy had texted her doctor friend and she wanted to know if he was going to be on the unit that day. And he said, no, he wasn't. And she replied, boo. <laughs> Like, mm, boo, boo who? You're not going to be here? I'm not going to be able to see you? Mm, well, I'll do something to get you here so we can see each other. Like, it's like when Harry met Sally, you know, Sleepless in Seattle, The Notebook, one of the great love stories of our time. Just make babies sick and make them crash and make their vital signs freaking plummet so that your love, your best friend, can come into the unit and you guys can look at each other and make eye contact over the body of a dead child. What a, f ooh, what a crazy bitch. So when baby P collapsed, Dr. A was the one to respond to the emergency crash call. And Nick Johnson asked Lucy during the trial, quote, did you enjoy being in these crisis situations with Dr. A? Did it give you something to talk about and message about? End quote. And I really do. I think this is a pretty good motive because... Things like that, right, trauma like that, going through something like that, it can bond to people. If you go through something like that, like consistently, it can bond to people. And she was, yeah, they were probably like talking about it after and she was asking him to reassure her that she had done nothing wrong. And she's like, I just feel so guilty. And he's like, don't feel guilty. Do you want me to bring my children over so that you can take care of them and see that I have trust in you and, and have your self-confidence revitalized? Ugh. Lucy claimed that she and the good doctor were just close friends. There was nothing romantic going on between them, <laughs> even though, like, then the note you sent him, I loved you. I think you know that. I loved you, my best friend. Um, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how I would talk to one of my friends who is of the opposite sex, but okay. She definitely, there's definitely something going on. And it's interesting because a lot of people who were in the courtroom that day made note of this. When Dr. A testified against Lucy behind a curtain to protect his identity, of course, because he's a pussy, she visibly and emotionally reacted. And this was only the second time during the trial that she'd shown a hint of feeling anything, okay? So throughout the testimony of baby after baby that she'd hurt or killed, Lucy sat there stone-faced, not shedding a tear, not betraying a single thing. But when the court saw pictures of her cat and her room at her house, and when she heard the voice of her doctor lover, she could not contain the emotion that it was clear she was feeling, not for the babies she'd killed, but for what she had lost. Her home, her the comfort of her home, the familiarity of her room, the, her cat, um, her boyfriend, doctor. Additionally, I would like to say the treatment of baby O was especially cruel and violent, and this was the first baby that she attacked after getting back from Ibiza. Nick Johnson suggested that by that time, Lucy had gotten away with so much that she had misplaced confidence and believed she could do pretty much whatever she wanted. Dr. Andreas Marnrides, an expert in neonatal pathology, told the jury during the trial that bruising found on baby O's liver was due to intentionally inflicted trauma, an impact injury, the force of which was akin to him being in a car accident. So not only did Lucy kill babies by injecting air into their bloodstream, by overfeeding them, by giving them insulin that they didn't need, it looks like she also physically abused them. And Nick Johnson told the jury that Lucy had combined three of her known methods to kill this baby. She used overfeeding, injection of air, and assault. And the next day, she began to inflict the same torture on his brother, Baby P. And that's the thing to keep in mind, right? These newborn babies were fighting for their lives. And she didn't kill them quickly. They did not go peacefully. They suffered in extreme pain for the last hours of their incredibly short lives. Their incredibly short lives were filled with nothing but pain and torment. That is all they knew from the moment they were born. And Lucy did that. Um, when people who are watching the let me throughout this showing that just when they harrowing details of what was done to these children and a really crucial point that the judge had made, which I think is one of the most terrible things about this is that you use the word sadistic or sadism is that actually these babies were caused terrible pain injecting air oxygen into a baby causes it terrible terrible pain one own, one's only hope would have be been that these babies didn't feel anything in their few hours few days of their lives that they, they didn't end in pain but but they did which is which is even worse and compounding horror for the parents but the 
Nurse Letby was, Lisa Letby was just completely blank faced, appeared to just take, you know, no emotion. The only time she showed emotion was a picture of her cat in her bedroom. And, and also when there was conversations with a doctor who she claimed had a crush on and may have been motivated to get his attention uh, uh, by, by, by killing these babies. What does that tell you about her? Look, she undoubtedly was born a psychopath. You know, if we t look at all these psychiatric conditions being part nature, part nurture, very rarely is someone, born, they call it born evil. Okay, so born a psychopath. She has no conscience. She has no emotions as we understand them. Um, no remorse, no guilt, uh, nothing. It's it's like it's it's a sort of strange blank slate, and she I think was someone who, hiding in plain sight, quite ordinary looking girl, she tried out various things in her life to see how they felt. You know, she had good friends, she had a close family, you know, she had a lot of support. Nothing was really driving her. It's really hard to get our heads around mm. what pure psychopathy is like, but. She found her purpose, yeah. and her purpose was either by joining nursing and going into neonatal nursing specifically, or by ending up there and and killing these babies. This was her mission, zero empathy. She found something she got it, it definitely sadistic, sadistic pleasure. She got, a, she got a kick from it. She got a kick from the power. We're talking about this. That, that, that thing, the word psychopath is a word that I haven't seen bandied around about this woman. We Clearly, these are psychopathic traits. This said the narcissism, the absolute lack of concern for, for, for the babies, although professed it. But also, that I remember hearing one, one analyst who'd been in court saying, you know, she, she won either way. If the baby survived, um, you know, she was the hero nurse. If the babies didn't survive, poor Lucy battling to save a baby's life and being there and how traumatic it must be when you care for these little babies and, and it was it was all about her and and the, all the, about her. yeah and this is a worry for us, i suppose and we know some of the parents who gave testimony in court with their, their impact victim impact statements they were saying that um they, they, the lack of trust they now feel because you this lovely lady who was kind to them and as one mum said you know she chose the she chose the gown that my baby is buried in when she's the person who killed my baby i mean just horrific horrific revelations like that that the the person they thought was caring for their baby keeping their baby safe the person they thought it was comforting them was the person who'd done this to their baby and done this to them how how do you ever trust again if if the you know angel-faced nice nurse has done you so much harm. How can we trust anybody if they can hide in plain sight like this? Look, it's incredibly rare to have that level of sadistic psychopathy. It really, really is. I hate people to think this was in any way commonplace. So that's one thing to take away from it. But yes, part of her sadism, um, and that's a form of psychopathology, she carried on following up with these parents. You say she chose the gown. Yeah. She sent them condolences notes. Yeah. She virtually stalked these people after killing their babies. She was addicted to that behaviour. And now behind bars, what will happen, as would happen with the other rare occurrences of these psychopaths like Beverly Allen and so on, they don't discuss it again. It will never be talked about. She has now disassociated herself from what she has done. In fact, she never really related to it. Another theory of why Lucy did this was because she was bored. During the trial, Lucy told everyone, shamelessly I would say, that as a band five nurse, she was qualified to treat very sick babies in the ICU and she craved patients that would allow her to do that, to, would allow her to flex her skills. When she was not working with very compromised babies, Lucy admitted finding her work less stimulating. And she would text her friends and her colleagues while she was with these babies, supposedly taking care of them, and she would say she was bored. She wished she was in the ICU with a more interesting case. Senior nurse Catherine Calderbank told the jury that Lucy told her it was boring to just feed babies and, quote, if anything was going on with the nursery one, you would find she would migrate there, as we all do, to go and help. She would definitely end up in nursery one to assist. It was more that we were worried for Lucy's mental health because it can be upsetting emotional and sometimes exhausting as well at the end of the shift if you're constantly put in that stress situation all the time, end quote. And this nurse is saying that's why they didn't put her in the ICU all the time, uh, Room one is the ICU, where the most fragile. 
babies were kept. And she's saying it wasn't because Lucy wasn't skilled. It wasn't because Lucy wasn't qualified. She was, but we just didn't want her day after day after day to be impacted by this because it can be hard and you need a break from that sometimes. And maybe sometimes a normal person, like I can tell you, if I was a nurse in Lucy's position and I worked with babies who sometimes didn't make it, the thought of being able to sit in a quiet, dim nursery and feed a baby and rock the baby and sing to it and rub its little head and watch it sleep would be so peaceful, such a a needed escape, a reminder of, you know, beauty and innocence and good things in the world. You would need that unless you're a psychopath like Lucy who thrives off of death, destruction, violence, and pain. Because it wasn't upsetting for Lucy to be around these babies that were dying. In fact, it seemed to give her life and energy, which brings us to the next motive that Lucy simply just enjoyed doing this to babies. Patients and nurses alike reported that Lucy would act unusual when the baby's health started to decline. And Baby Eye's parents told the police that they remembered Lucy being so cheerful after their child died. Walking around, smiling, chatting, telling them how she was so grateful that she'd been there for their child's first bath. Nick Johnson suggested that Lucy got a thrill out of watching the grief and despair around her. She kept trophies of her victims, like a serial killer. She sent sympathy cards to their parents. She sat on Facebook and looked up her victims' parents like an addict. She talked about the babies and their illnesses or their deaths with her colleagues as if she was trying to relive them over and over again and drain every last bit of attention and dopamine that their deaths had given her. And so at the end of the day, with all of these motives potentially in play, because it might not be just one of them, it could be all of them, right? It could be all of them. Some people have said she's a psychopath. Some people have said she's a narcissist. She could have tendencies of narcissism. She could have psychopathic tendencies. We could look back in her childhood and say, what happened to her? You know, I know everybody always wants to find an excuse for why people do horrible things. Looks like Lucy had a pretty good childhood, right? Born to two parents who loved her, doted upon her. She was an only child. They gave her everything she could ever want, including their attention and their love. They were always there for her. They supported her. They were proud of her achievements. For her whole life, it looked like she was middle to upper class. Uh, she got an education. She didn't have any real struggles in life that, that I could find. And the most that, that anybody ever said was that Lucy felt her parents were a little bit like overbearing, you know, like a little um, too clingy. Like they always wanted to make sure they knew where she was, that she was... They were worried about her living alone. They didn't like her living far away from home, things like that, you know. But besides that, there nothing happened to her. Nothing happened to her. Sometimes people are just not right. Sometimes people are just irreparably broken and damaged. And there's no abuse or trauma that you can highlight in their past to give them an excuse or a justification for why they did what they did. And I believe Lucy Letby is one of those people. And I honestly believe a lot more people are like that than we really can admit because we always look in the past and we always look at their childhood to find something that will explain why they are this evil, why they're they're this horrible. Because it makes us feel better, I think, to find a reason, to find an excuse, to find something to point to and say, ah, there it is, that's why, rather than to just understand and believe and know that that there are evil people in the world, that there are people born into this world who do horrible things, who hurt other people for no other reason than they just get a kick out of it or they felt like it. And that's where I think Lucy lies. I think she was trying to get the attention of Dr. A. I think she was trying to gain his admiration, his respect. I think she was trying to create a false bond, a manufactured bond with him. I think she was trying to get attention from her friends, her coworkers. I think she was getting off on it. I think she enjoyed it. I think she really did. I think that's why she kept those uh, documents from the hospital so she could look at them, relive it like a serial killer with trophies. And I think that she was just so used to getting all this attention from her parents, getting her way all the time, being like the golden child, being the apple of everybody eye that when she moved away from home entered the real world and was just kind of normal person like the police described her as being beige like completely just normal nothing stood out about her there was nothing 
fantastic about her. There was nothing sparkling about her. She was just a normal, beige, boring person who went out with friends and went to work and went home and, you know, slept with her cat and then got up and did it all over again every day. There was nothing that was like st- stood out about her that would give her the attention she'd become accustomed to from her parents who are going to love you like you sparkle like the sun no matter what you do and no matter how beige you are, right? And so this sent her into an almost like Um, dopamine deficiency like she just couldn't even understand what was happening why aren't people praising me why aren't people giving me attention and that's possible that that could have been what was going on with her she needed a way to somehow be the center of attention again she needed a way to somehow be um, the person that everybody looked to that everybody felt bad for that everybody comforted that everybody made sure to pay attention to and ugh, it's just tragic but at the end of the day it's the best possible outcome. Like if these babies had to die, Lucy going to prison for life and hopefully getting a good old-fashioned prison beatdown that will teach her a lesson, um, it's the, the most we can hope for at this point. So let me know what you all think about this in the comment section. Let me know. What, I mean, I don't think that there's anybody at this point that can still be thinking Lucy Letby is innocent or that she's been wrongly convicted or that there's even a chance she's innocent. But if you think that, let me know. Please give me some supporting evidence for your delusions. <laughs> but anyways, talk to me in the comment section. Oh, before we go, we have a small business showcase that I want to talk about. Stephanie's small business showcase. Woo! Okay, our small business today comes from Emily DeVood, who's a nail tech in Muskegee, Oklahoma at Willow and Joe Salon. She said she's been there for about a year as of this month, and she's been making and selling press-on nails for two years. She hadn't had a lot of good luck on Etsy, which is very common because there's so many shops on Etsy. So she took her Etsy shop down, and now she takes orders through Instagram and Facebook, as well as from clients in the salon. And these are awesome, okay? These are super cute. She offers acrylic. Gel X, gel polish, and natural nail services, as well as custom press on nail sets. Um, and these are so cool. Her Instagram is Davood Does Nails. I will link it for you. Oh, she's so pretty. And these press-on nails look so good. Like, they look like real nails. And the cool thing is they're probably way quicker than sitting down and getting your nails done. They have cool nail art on them. Like, these ones have suns and moons. These ones are just cool, like, geometric shapes. Some of them are clear with stars. Oh, there's, like, Star Wars ones here. Um, There's just solid colors like pink, blue, looks like she does holiday and occasion nails, lots and lots and lots of options. And I know that um, a lot of people have trouble growing their nails. I know that a lot of people want to have their nails done but don't necessarily have the time to kind of keep up with it every two weeks or even the money because it's incredibly, incredibly pricey nowadays. And this looks like the perfect solution to, you know, being able to have your nails look the way you want them to without the time and money it takes to go to a salon and have to you know go through the whole process and it looks like you can probably switch them out a lot easier like you could um, change them out whenever you want things like that so this is awesome love this I love this so go check out Emily and her nails thank you so much for being here today don't forget to like the video if you liked it share it if you think it's worth sharing and as always subscribe if you haven't because there's so many people who are you know watching the video that aren't subscribed But if you're coming back and it's your second, third video, subscribe, okay? And don't forget to tell me what you think about all of this in the comment section. Thank you so much for being here today with me. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go I got blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings Been played so far, please don't be Got blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings Blood, no, it's been a rough week Tell
in my soul.